Welcome to the Tetra Key Business Revolutionary Podcast. My name is Rob Yates, Tetra Key CEO, co founder, and serial entrepreneur. In these podcasts, we're going to be bringing to you true business revolutionaries. That people who've done it differently, done it their way, had success, achieved more than the rest, and are willing to share with you exactly how they went about doing it. As well as that, Mark Hopkins, my co-founder, and I will be bringing you podcasts where we give you information about what it is we're doing to grow a business from one country across five continents in just four years. In this episode, I am so proud to be able to bring you David Marquet. David is a former US Navy submarine commander who was described by Dr. Stephen Covey as leading the most empowering organization he'd ever seen. David is one of the world's leading experts on intent-based leadership and author of best-selling book, Turn the Ship Around, which Fortune magazine recommended as its number one read describing it as the best how-to manual anywhere for managers on delegating training and driving flawless execution amongst other things david now runs a successful business and is a regular correspondent to forbes magazine ladies and gents grab hold of your seats grab hold of your hats this one is a game changer This podcast is brought to you by the Tetra Key Business Revolutionary Club, our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month loads of free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, or follow revolutionaryclub.tetrakey.com. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this podcast and a ginormous welcome to David Marquet. Now, I first heard of David a few years ago when my business partner, Mark Hopkins, said, you have to read this and handed me a copy of David's book, Turn the Ship Around. This book has turned into one of our six integral texts that Mark and I keep referring back to in our work as coaches. And in fact, it's one of the few books that I've read three times. Mark and I've always had if only conversations and David, you were part of one of these. If only we could get David Marquet on the podcast. So when Mark emailed me yesterday from where he's working as a coach at the Commonwealth Games in Australia, saying I was interviewing David today, I almost fell off my stool with excitement. So David, here we are. And I guess that we should start with what drew you to submarines and leadership. (laughs) So um, the submarine part was fairly deliberate. The leadership part was fairly accidental. So... I grew up in the uh, 70s. I went to high school in the 70s. And if anyone, anyone was there with me in the 70s, you know it was a pretty depressing time. Uh, we had uh, this conflict with the Soviet Union. And uh, I was one of these introverted, uh, geeky kids. I was on the math team uh, in high school. So that's a thing where you go and you do calculus problems try and do them better and faster than the other team. Anyway, it's a kind of thing that uh, geeks and introverts do. But I also felt very strongly that the liberal democracy way of living your life was a better way of living your life. And I wanted to do my part to support that. And so I made a commitment that I was going to, that I was going to, and, and, and for me, that meant going into the military, even the, and that was a break from family tradition. My dad was a 
ADHD. And so uh, when you're an introvert and you make this commitment to go in the military, I got to tell you, it's kind of scary. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But I was an avid history reader as well. And I'd read about these things called submarines. And the job of the submarine is to hide from people. So I was like, that's perfect for someone like me. And I'm going to be, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, like the a picture of the 10 year old standing up and saying, I'm going to be a fireman. So, you know, I was, by this point I was in high school. I was like, I'm going to be a submarine commander. And lo and behold, I actually ended up being a submarine commander, but that was my commitment to, to do something uh, to, to, to hopefully to make the world a better place. That's, that's how I thought I could contribute. Wow. And, um, you know, we all have defining moments in our lives and often sometimes uh, they're unexpected. Uh, sometimes we're not even grateful for them at the time and yet it happens and it defines us. Yeah, exactly. And, they're, they're, they're unexpected and unappreciated. That's it. That's it. And so, until, so, until maybe you write a book about that defining moment or yeah, something. Like, <laughs> exactly. So, so what happened to me was uh, I was doing great. I was... Uh, I was practicing the model of leadership that's espoused in, in the book that the Naval Academy gave me. And it says leadership is directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others so as to obtain and command their obedience, their confidence, and their respect and their loyal cooperation. And it's a very uh, authoritarian model of leadership, which I now call the knowing and the telling model, because the idea is it's, it's, it's clearly telling, but behind the telling is this assumption of knowing that the leader knows best. And the person who knows best is the person to be the leader because they're the person who's going to tell everyone else what to do. And I was, um, to be honest, scary good at that, scary good at that. And because of that, the Navy promoted me and they said, oh, you're going to be a submarine captain and congratulations. And now, of course, I was thrilled and I was going to be the captain of the USS Olympia, which is a fine running uh, submarine out in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And what happened was at the very last minute, I got vectored over to the Santa Fe because the captain on the Santa Fe quit a year early. The Navy hadn't programmed a replacement and... The sand, and the reason he quit was because the ship was doing very poorly, poor morale, poor performance, poor retention numbers. And uh, to his credit, uh, he said, you know, I'm not, I'm not the uh, answer here. And uh, I, so I resigned. And so the Navy said, well, Mark, hey, you just finished school for the, yeah, it was for the Olympia, but you, you're going to go to the Santa Fe instead. And to me, this was one of the scariest, uh, un, unexpected and unappreciated moments of my life because the Santa Fe, it wasn't, it, the problems with the ship that I told you about were not things that I didn't think I could deal with. Uh, poor morale, poor performance. Yeah, you know, if you're the smart guy in the room, you just tell everyone what to do and just do what I say for the next six months and everything will be fine, right? That's kind of the picture that, <laughs> that I think we sometimes get, but that was not going to work because the Santa Fe is a different kind of ship. Santa Fe is one of the newest ships in the fleet. And you go to school for a year for your ship before you even get there. And so when you walk around the ship, the degree to which you know the submarine is amazing. You can basically operate any piece of gear, push every, you know what, every button does. Santa Fe, I didn't have that. And I jokingly call that my not knowing but still telling phase uh, because I was still in this mode well, captains give orders and crews follow them. And the crew, we were both happy with that. I mean, we weren't thrilled, but the crew expected me to tell them what to do. And I was happy to oblige them. The problem, of course, was since I didn't know the details of the ship, I almost immediately gave a bad order. Mm. And um, is, is there still a place for the author authoritarian sort of leadership style in today's workplace? Uh, yeah, I think there is. And so, you know, our story is the solution to giving bad orders typically is to give better orders, but the solution, uh, that was not available to me because there was no way I could learn the whole ship. So, so the solution we struck upon was to stop giving orders. And what happens is there's a focus on building the team and building a team that 
doesn't need to be told what to do and you're building the decision-making capacity in the team and you win in the long run. Although in the short run, it's very aggravating and very frustrating. And what happens is I think in situ, so, there, so there's a couple situations where if you see what needs to happen, then you just tell people what to do. If you're, if you're the fire commander on a firefighting team, there's not a lot of time. You need, sometimes you need, uh, and something happens and the team is not seeing it and you see it, and you may, you may just have to issue an order. Say, everyone out of the building. So I do think this happens. I think a lot of times, however, we, we fall back on this model uh, out of laziness. Basically, because we don't, have the, we don't have the discipline and the commitment to building the team, and it's just easier for us to just tell people what to do and, and tell them to get on with it, rather than the discipline of investing a few minutes and building the capacity of the team to make decisions. And, and the self-moderating behavior of, you might have the idea in your head, but you got you to gotta just block it and say, well, what do you guys think? And if I weren't here, what would you do? And uh, you know, if you had to make this decision on your own, what would you do? If you were to sign the piece of paper authorizing this decision, what would, what would be, what would you be signing? And by changing their perspective, you're inviting them into thinking. And it's the thinking that we're in short supply of these days. And so um, a, a, about a year or so, I see, after you'd been on the Santa Fe, Dr. Stephen Covey came and spent some time with you and said that you'd created the most empowering organization he'd ever seen. Now, I mean, that's a, that's a compliment of the highest order as a starter. Um, <laughs> that was thrilling. I mean, so I was a huge Covey fan and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was one of my go-to books. And... Um, it was a great day with Dr. Covey and he, he's watching, he's just sort of quiet. He's watching the crew. He heard what was going on and he invited himself out and the Navy approved his visit. So that was wonderful. And we took him underway and we submerged the ship and drove fast and turned hard and that kind of fun stuff. And, um, he says, he said, uh, you know, I'm surprised I haven't seen you give any orders. And I say, yeah, I'm out of the order. <laughs> kind of joking with Dr. Guy. I'm out of the order giving business. And he said, well, how'd you do it? I said, well, I read your book. So I knew I had him at that point. Because, of, you know, habit one is be proactive. And in the book, in Seven Habits, it sort of, it sort of describes that at a personal level. Like you personally be proactive. And, and in, in one version of the story, all I was doing was taking those personal habits and trying to institutionalize them in, and, and really root them in language. And so the question we said was, what does is, what is being proactive sound like at an institutional level? And what it sounds like is people stating their intentions to do things, not waiting for permission. And so a lot of my guys had no idea um, like where the, like what this quote psychological uh, underpinning were. All they knew was if they came to me, they had better say what they, they, be, they had better tell me what they intend to do, not ask permission. Cause they knew that if they were going to ask me for permission to do something, I wasn't going to, I was not going to respond. So, so that was what we did. And it was really, really wonderful. And then the other thing that Dr. Covey did is he, he says, and I, and I know how you're doing this, <laughs> which I was like, well, that's great. Cause we were a year into it and it, it felt very messy. And I said, well, that's great. Cause we don't know how we're doing it. And he said, I think what's happening is when people come up and say, tell me what to do you, you, and, and not just you, but your officers and your chiefs and all the leaders don't tell people what to do. They resist telling people what to do. And they say, well, what, what do you see? And it all starts with that. What do you see? What do you observe? Too many times people say, well, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You tell me what to do. And that's a big jump. So we would, uh, it, we would walk people there with, hey, what do you see? What do you think? What do you think's happening? What would you recommend? And then finally, what, would you in, what do you intend to do? We, so we, we, we walk them there incrementally, which makes it safe as opposed to scary. Otherwise, it's too big. It's too Oh no, it's your decision. Oh no, that's that's scary. That's too big, too big a jump. 
And did you start that with your uh, like immediate direct reports and then filter it down through the whole submarine or just stick it all out there at once? What was your strategy for changing this? Yeah, so calling it a strategy is generous. <laughs> it was like when I gave the bad order, I gave a bad order the very first day we were underway. It was, it was an order to shift into second gear on a backup, on a backup motor that only had one gear. And when it came to light, right, it came to light, it was embarrassing, but, but the officer had actually ordered it. And I said, why? And he said, because you, did you know? He said, yeah, I knew there was only one gear. I said, why did you order it? You told me to. And for me, it felt my, more like desperation than panic. It was like, well, we're going to die. We, cause I'm going to say something, these guys are going to do it and we're going to die. So it wasn't so, it didn't feel like courage. It felt like desperation and panic. I said, we need a different solution. We can't have me telling you guys what to do and you doing what you're told. And the normal approach, which I had been subjected to was, oh, asterisk. And if what I say doesn't make sense, you have to correct me. But that to me felt like just putting the responsibility on the team, not taking responsibility for my own behavior. Leaders out there, you got to start with yourself. It, the only person's behavior you can control is your own. And what I see too many times is, well, that's hard. That's messy. That means I have to take responsibility. That means I need to exercise self-control and I need to monitor my emotions and my reactions. That's so hard. So I'll just you know, I'll just put it on everybody else instead because that's so much easier. And that's a cop out. I noticed that, that a lot of this is all around the power of language, the power of um, active questionings that give somebody the opportunity to be empowered as opposed to disempowered. And, and something strikes me as I've read through and listened to your stuff that there's, there's an absence of the word why. Why? <laughs> Why is that? So he, here's the problem. Hey, boss, I think, I think we should delay the uh, software release. Why? Hey, boss, I think we should add a new feature. Why? Uh, the problem is why comes across as sort of defensive and provocative, and, and it provokes a, um, a sense of, oh, I must be wrong. I need to defend myself. And you don't always get to hear the full story. I like to say, okay, look, I, no matter how crazy the idea is, I'm going to just temporarily suspend my um, judgment on it. And I'm just going to think that they're correct. And I'm going to invoke curiosity, which sounds like what and how to me. Start the question with what and how. Okay. How does, like, how, how does that play out? How will that look? What would the first steps be? Uh, what are you seeing that's, that's make, bringing you to that conclusion? Uh, and so I, I just find that you end up with a lot more uh, sharing and uh, the team feels more open to share because the, pro because the problem is we want people to share past the superficial, well, I read the book and it says ABC. We need to get to their fears and emotions and their in or, or use the word intuition maybe if you want. All decision making is ultimately grounded in emotion and intuition. And we can rationalize uh, and we can build spreadsheets all day long. But at the end of the day, we got to make, we, especially in a world where, we, where it's fast moving and things are changing and we're dealing with a, a very capable enemy that may react to what they see us doing. You don't know. You just don't know. And so you're going to go. And so what happens is people have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty because they affect the future. And so to do that, we got to practice the language of uncertainty and ambiguity and safety. And so for me, um, the, simp the simple rule I had was to start my questions with what and how whenever possible. It also helps you because um, here's another example. We would, uh, we would get set to do something and, the, and we would say, okay, are we, is it, are we all ready? And like everyone just sort of, you know, automatically bob their heads up and down. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Are we ready? Do you have the tools you have? Oh yeah, sure. But is it safe? Yeah. Uh-huh. So those are three binary self-affirming questions, none of which are helpful. So now what we say is start, okay, what tools do you have and how safe is it? Yeah, it's pretty safe because when you ask how safe is it, you can detect a change in the response. Like, is it safe? Yes or no. Is a very high 
it, it's got to be really, really unsafe before someone's going to say it's unsafe. Whereas if you say, how safe is it on a scale of one to five and people hold their hand up, it, the, the, the sensitivity to a change is much higher because it's much easier for someone to say, yeah, today I'm going to show four fingers instead of five. So the trick is ask questions that allow you to see the signal at the most, uh, at the faintest level possible. And binary questions are just not the way to get there. So we avoid binary questions. We avoid uh, why questions and we ask what and how questions. So it strikes me that this is around uh, the process of learning for everybody all of the time. Is that, is that correct? Learning. Or like yeah. learning, learning how to learn because uh, <laughs> Some, some people have forgotten how to use their heads to a, a high enough level, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I totally right. And um, so the idea is, uh, well, the, the, pro, the, the problem we had is like, sometimes I need you to do what you're told. Like you're going to wear a hard hat and you're going to wear safety glasses and steel toed shoes. And this is not really a moment of um, an opportunity for decision making by you. But then there are a lot of times, okay, when we say, well, okay, we're going to load a torpedo, but so the loading of the torpedo, the step-by-step -step process, that is where we want the compliance. But are we ready to load the torpedo? Which torpedo are we going to, going to load? What time are we going to start? Who's going to be on the team? These are all, these, this is where the decision-making happens. So you have a group of people who have to bounce between compliance at one moment and creativity at another moment. And for me, it's almost like there's two different languages. It would be, it would have been awesome if we could sp like spoke Spanish for one and English for the other. I don't know if we would have choose, chosen, but the, the, the point is it sounds different. Like compliance is like, okay, now everyone now put their hard hat on. Okay, great. And uh, creativity is now what does everybody think? And it's about embracing diversity and variability versus in conformity, we want to reduce variability and diversity. And so the problem we get into in business is we apply. Uh, so by the way, our go-to structures are all reduced variability structures. Uh, so uh, if, 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 if the language feels natural, if the meeting practice feels natural, it's probably a reduced variability structure. Here's an example. We discuss something and then we vote. The act of discussing it first and then voting, especially if the vote is going to be a Roman vote, uh, binary vote, is ipso facto going to reduce the variability of the uh, outcomes versus what you want to do is vote first in a, in a probabilistic way. And how strongly do people feel about this? Okay, delay release, vote over here. If, you know, and, and not just delay or don't delay. It's like, I feel very strongly we should delay release. I feel very strongly we, sh we should release on time. I feel, eh, meta meta, And let them vote probabilistically. And it could be, um, they just write numbers on cards and slide them out. Then you flip them over. Now what you look for is the outliers. You have to embrace the outliers. Who's got the ones? Who's got the 99s? We never let zeros and hundreds because it's an uncertain world. And then we give voice to those people. So that's the method for embracing variability. So the idea is our standard language patterns are generally going to be reduced variability conforming language patterns because that's the uh, legacy of the industrial revolution. And so we need to be deliberate about using embrace variability language patterns. Because mm, there's, there's that thing where the uh, if, uh, if, if you're the leader and put your input in at the very start and then ask people to make some form of decision, yeah. they're, they're very kind of uh, impressed isn't right. Isn't the, necessarily the right word, but they're they're kind of swayed to being compliant towards the leader's thought process. Exactly, they're biased. As a leader, you got to be really good with the poker face. You you can't let the, let on what you think, because as soon as you do, you're going to be biasing the group. You'll be anchoring the group around your uh, your thoughts. And if like you already know what you think, so you don't need to pay people to reinforce that that's a waste of money so so what structures so, um, uh, intent-based leadership what structures does an organization or business need to put in place for itself to make this style of leadership uh 
be more sticky, not be something that people try for a couple of weeks and then go, well, that didn't work and, and abandon it. What sort of preparation do they need to think about? I'll give you three things. And the, the, this is, if I were to write the book again today, uh, I would probably spend more time talking about these three things because in the Navy, these are the things that actually enabled me to do uh, what I did. Clear ownership, clear processes, and clear language. So when you walk around the submarine, you put your hand on, on something, you just reach out and touch a valve or a piece of equipment, and you ask the next 10 sailors who walk by you, what's the name of that? They will all say exactly the same thing. They will say the exact same word. And in most businesses, I don't see that. So sometimes, oh, those are our clients. Oh, no, they're our customers. Oh, no, they're our partners. Oh, no. Like, well, what's the word you're going to use? Well, does it really matter? Um, yeah, because we can't have a conversation if you say customer and I'm thinking client. And then, first of all, it's just unnecessary mental taxation. But the other thing is that it reveals real um, muddled thinking. Like muddled language comes from muddled thinking. So if you don't have, if you have muddled language, it's because you have muddled thinking. So peel that back and say, okay, have a conversation. Who are, what are we going to call them? What about, okay, what if they made an inquiry? So for us, like uh, they make an inquiry, but they haven't booked um, the event yet. What, what are they, prospects? Or, you know, what, you have to come up with the words you're going to use. Um, and that, that underpins everything. But then, then it goes, the next thing is ownership. If you don't know what you own, if you don't know the boundaries of what you own, then it's very hard to take uh, own, to, to, to make decisions about it because you never know, oh, am I, am I going to be stepping on this person's toes? Oh, is that beyond the boundary or, or not close enough to the boundary? And I've had some, um, some leaders challenge me on this and they say, you know what? I just want to see people. I'm just going to let, let them see. I'm just going to see the natural leaders emerge. It doesn't work like that, I, I don't think. There was a famous study where they, they had, um, uh, this was a school, kids were playing, they had a fence. The kids would play throughout the playground up to the fence. The fence protected them from the street. And uh, someone said, well, you know, fences are bad. Take the fence down. What happened? You know what? The kids just all played right in the middle of the playground because they didn't know where the boundary was and the street was a scary place. So what happens is if people know the boundaries. They know what they own. They can play right up to the – they can play. It's just like, you know um, – uh, in, 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 on a hockey game, right? There is a line where the field ends <laughs> and you can play right up to the line and you, and you do. So uh, what, what if we took the line away and say, yeah, it's over there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and um, so anyway, so I'm a huge fan of clear uh, ownership. So I'm, maybe I'm a traditionalist but I think this idea that we clearly define people's swim lanes and that they know what it is, I think is really important. Otherwise, it ends up being a mess. So there has to be some form of uh, clear, defined objective, goal, strategy, something that everybody's working towards for them to make all those decisions on. Is that right? Yeah. So my job changed a little bit. In the old way, I would walk out into the country to the control room and say, look, I need you guys to put the ship here. We need to be here at six o'clock tomorrow morning. We need to have all torpedo tubes loaded, be here. And, um, and it changed. I had to get better at saying, at, at resisting saying that and say, okay, here's the objective. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to prevent an enemy submarine from getting close enough to the carrier or whatever it might be. We're trying to pick up a SEAL team. And then I would have to leave <laughs> And say, so you guys work on that, and then I'll be back in 20 minutes. You got to do the I'll be back in 20 minutes part. And then say, okay, you got, when I come back, I'm happy to hear how we're going to do that. Many leaders and managers, business owners that we end up working with, um, they actually kind of fear this, side, this leadership style. Um, and that leads them to having a dabble and a go um, at – uh, empowering their workforce to do different, do better, do make decisions. Um, and I wonder what you can, could offer them to persuade them to take a brave new step and, and stick with it. What's the immense upsides of this for a business? Okay. So Rob, here's the deal. 
if you're the leader and you feel like you need to make things happen, I, I picture that as you have a gas pedal and a brake pedal because not only do you have to make things happen, but every once in a while you're going to be like, I'll stop. We're chopping down the wrong forest, guys. We got to go do something different. And it's very difficult to have the perspective of are we doing the right work if your head is always in the game of let's make sure we're doing the work right. And so what happens here is if you create a team where there's a bias for action, that's what the word intent does for, for you. They're coming to you with, hey, this is what we intend to do. And only if you stop us will it not happen. Now you don't need to be pushing the gas. All you need to do is worry about the brake pedal. And so you're, you're at a higher level perspective because the, the team is making sure things are happening. There's a sense of urgency and purpose in the team, resident in the team. And a lot of business owners, especially like if they're the founders or the, they started the thing or whatever, then they feel like, oh, I'm the only one with sense of purpose, passion, and intensity and, and uh, impatience. Everyone else just seems to be happy to you know, kind of move at half speed. So they get sucked into the work and you avoid that. You see patterns that others don't see and it becomes very, very powerful to have the combination of like one person is looking out, are we chopping on the right forest? And everyone else is chopping as fast as they can. Mm. Awesome. And so um, some of the audience will be listening to this now and thinking, uh, well, that's very nice. Um, is there some practical things that they can start to do and practice now so they can start to adopt a different style of leadership in their business? Yeah. So, so you can, you, first of all, what I'm talking about is giving up the control of some of these operational decisions. You want to control rigidly the structure, how the team interacts, who owns what. I think these are things that you want to, that, that are legitimate for the leaders to control. But if you do the right thing there, in other words, if you write the algorithms by which your team's going to um, operate, you can release control of how, how the algorithms perform. And so, uh, but, but one of the things is you're going to have to give up control. And so one of the things we do for CEOs that we're coaching is we say, okay, the next time you go out to dinner, for the next 10 times you go out to eat, you can't order you have to turn to the waiter or the waitress and say, you pick for me and don't play it safe. I learned this trick uh, from Robert Stevens who founded Geek Squad and then he sold it to Best Buy. It's a computer services company up here in North America. And uh, it's great because you, you, you have the same anxieties, <laughs> right, that you have at work, but it's very safe. Now, if you have like a peanut allergy, you, you want to say, oh, by the way, you're providing clarity. I can't eat peanuts or I, you know, I'm on a diet or I don't like dairy, whatever it happens to be, that's okay. But you can't go all the way down to the point of like anything between item seven or eight, that's fine. Okay, so try and make the aperture as big as possible. You're also going to have to deal with the server's response. Some servers are going to say, oh, that's awesome. Some are going to say, yeah, I don't know. Like, really? Do you want me? You know? And, uh, that's the same thing as that will happen with your team at work. Some will, will respond very enthusiastically. Some will be more skeptical. And the key here is you're going to have to make it safe. You're going to have to figure out how to make it safe for that server to pick for you. And that is a great mental practice to go through over and over and over and over again. Plus, you end up with a lot more fun. Dinner. <laughs> so it's, it's almost like chucking your car keys to somebody and asking them to drive you. It's exactly like that. It, yeah, exactly like that. Because uh, I, I know personally yeah. that's, uh, that's something. I can give away all sorts of responsibility, but giving, letting somebody else drive me always makes me nervous. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right. Oh, my gosh. So, so find the thing for you that you feel like, no, I need to really be in control of this and really tr practice um, give, you know, giving up control in a, in a s small, incremental, and safe way. Because that's exactly how it's going to have to play out at work. Small, incremental, and safe. Don't go too far and too fast because then it'll go too fast and then you'll feel uncomfortable. They'll feel uncomfortable. You'll have a big calamity and then they'll say, oh, yeah, we tried empowerment, didn't work. Yeah, I've, I've, been, um, I've been playing with this recently with, with driving the car. 
and um, only using <laughs> Uber Monday through Friday for work. And oh, yeah, that right? and uh, it's it's been a really really liberating experience. Um, you know, I can sit in the back and work while somebody else drives me. It's uh, it's really yeah. not that much more expensive. In fact, arguably the same price as driving your own vehicle. And I've probably gained ten to twelve hours in the week every week um, when I would have been sat in the behind the steering wheel. It's been a, it's been quite an interesting nice. experiment. Is it getting easier to to do? What do you think? Uh, yeah. Especially. See, I asked a binary question there, so I didn't follow my own <laughs> advice. I said, "Is it easier?" I should say, "How are you feeling? What or how? Like, like how 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 is it different now than it was when you started?" That would have been a better question. I think the the fact that I'm not I'm not having to work every evening just doing mindless keeping up on admin email stuff because I get most of that done or report writing or whatever else in the back yeah. of an Uber um, is. It is an absolute blessing, but it, you, you don't know what the upside of it's going to be until you've actually done it for a while. Because you, you, at some point right. in time, you have to take that leap of faith and go, I assume this is going to be the benefit. Um, but you then have to go and do it. Do you? Test it Rob, that was such, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm so excited. I had to cut No you worries, off. go for it. What were you going to say? Well, well, I was going to say, so I, I think that's a really great, it's a really important point because what we're doing is we're investing in people and it's all investments in people are long term investments. And if you're always under the pressure, pressure of a short term delivery, then um, you're never, it doesn't make sense to make these long term investments. It's a long term uncertain investment. Now I think at the end of the day, there's a potentially huge payoff, which overwhelms the, uh, the risk of the uncertainty and, uh, uh, and the, you know, the long-term nature of it, but you gotta, you know, there'll be some days when you're like, God, I wish we could, you know, when is that all going to happen? And I can just tell you um, my own experience now running my own company and, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, trying to eat our own dog food here that um, there are going to be really frustrating days when you're like, why are they not stepping up? Do I need to step in and get them moving again? And you may also, you may dip down, you may go down to, okay, here, here I'm just gonna like, let me tell you what to do today, blah, blah, blah. But the, the target zone is always to get back to intent and say, okay, so here's the deal though. You know, I need to, I need to get you to intent, like our objective together, but, but it's gotta be something they wanna do. <clears throat> Like if they're like, nah, I'm happy. Just tell me what to do. Say, okay, fine. I'll tell you what to do in six months. I'm going to ask you the question again. Yeah, because it's a it's a yeah, it's a longitudinal piece of work, really, isn't it? What was tell, tell me what was the tipping point for you leaving the U.S. submarine service? Here's what happened. Okay, on the Santa Fe, everything went really well. We won a whole bunch of awards, and then uh, the story was was great. And we got promoted. I got promoted. My guys were getting promoted. Uh, but what happened was over the next 10 years, we ended up with a, the Navy selected a highly disproportionate number of the officers and chiefs on the Santa Fe to go to higher leadership positions. And it struck me that that was the story that I wanted to tell. And I kept trying to write it in the evenings after working at the Pentagon or whatever. And I just was too exhausted to do it. And I didn't feel like the Navy's, um, the Navy measures things sort of like, you know, in seconds and minutes and hours and days, not in decades uh, when it comes to sort of personal performance. And I felt like, you know, the secret sauce of what I'd been able to contribute was this approach, which resulted in benefits being measured out, not, not only in days, but also really over, over a decade or longer. And that uh, in order to, to tell the story, I, I had to open, I had to open the aperture. Cool. And, that, and that's now taken you into the world of running your own business, uh, talking on stage, coaching people. <laughs> um, tell us, tell us more about that. How, how was it leaving the, the, the military and stepping into the civilian world? It, well, it was, it was frightening of course, but the, <laughs> So first of all, 
you got to remember, I was like this. The reason I went to be a submariner is because I was afraid of people. I was an introvert. I was easily overstimulated. I just wanted to, you know, I, I was more happier with a book on Saturday night in the library than going to a party. And so now I got to stand up in front of audiences of, you know, a thousand people. Uh, so it's been a stretch thing for me. The other thing is, my world was always about numbers and equations and engineering and math and science. And now it tends to be more about storytelling and language and imagery. Uh, and, and it's been kind of fun because I feel like it's, uh, it's a new chapter for me. And I tell you, it's a big world. Like when you're in the Navy, you drive all around the planet, you think like you have a sense of the world. It, no, it is a big, big, big world. And I, we've now been to um, 25 countries doing various talks, except South Africa. That's not one of them yet. But um, yet. Uh, and so it's just been really fun meeting all these people and seeing like amazing things happening all over the planet. And I have to tell you, I'm just struck uh, over and over again. I was in China. My book came out in Chinese and I was in China um, a couple of years ago. And I called my wife and I said, you know what? I could be in Kansas from the sense of it's the same longings, the same desires. People want to have lives that mean something and make a better life for their kids. And it's the same. And um, I, I think there's this universality of human experience, which I didn't perhaps appreciate uh, as much before. So what next for David Marquet and Turn the Ship? <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'm working on a new book, which is giving me a lot of stress and anxiety, but I have a good um, team now. I have a, the first book I had to write by myself, but I have... Um, a research assistant who's helping me. And this new book is about the plays of leadership. What are the recurring plays that we go to as leaders? Uh, and so what we feel is that we've looked at all kinds of different uh, models and structures and the best-selling business books. And I think there's some, some common themes that run through all of these things. And what we're, gonna, what we're trying to do is expose those common themes in a very language-based way, in a very practical way. It's the, the subtitle, I'm, I'm fighting with the publisher, but I, I want it to be something like, don't say that, say this. And, it's, and it goes back to the power of language. So uh, it's fun because I, you know, all day long I get material for, uh, for, uh, for the book, both in terms of good things and bad. Awesome. So as we um, as we come towards our, the end of our time together, um, firstly, thank you for the time. Thank you for everything you're doing for the the world in terms of I honestly think getting organisations to treat their both their customers and their workforce more humanely um, to get people to think for themselves. I um, I wonder though, what's been the biggest lesson you've learned in the past that you still apply today? Well, for some reason, my head is kind of going into a dark place. Because I've had some bad jobs and I've had some some leaders that created toxic environments. And I've I've had I've worked in places where I felt under continuous attack and stress and pressure. Not not real attack, like you know, the enemy actually killing us. That's okay. You can deal with that, but just sort of from an internal um you know, office politics or, you know, uh, a hostile boss kind of thing. And I wish that I had been more forceful about saying things like, you know, you, you don't, you don't get to talk to me like that, not in a, like an angry way, but just like, you, you can't talk to me like that. I'm going to, I'm putting a line down. And we always justify it in terms of, well, you know, I'm playing for the promotion or I want to be a team player or whatever. We excuse bad behavior. And um, my, my thing for everybody is don't put up with that. And my test is if, imagine if your kid were in the same job, would you want them to put up with that stuff? And if the answer is no for them, then it should be no for you. 
And what I really wish is that if people quit these toxic environments, then there would be no one working in toxic environments, and that would be awesome. That truly would be awesome. <laughs> truly would be awesome. And so, yeah. um, what's the thing that you're preparing for today that you think will happen in the future? Um, and how are you preparing for it? So, I, I think we have a theme where we've divided work into what we call um, red work and blue work. Red work is the production work, red work is the doing work, and blue work is the thinking work, blue, blue work is the creativity work. And we think that red work is going away. That if your company is rooted in red work, uh, it, that's okay if you're pushing it into the machines. But more and more, blue work will become more and more important, even in traditional red work jobs. So even, even like a manufacturing, someone in manufacturing here today is is really more of a CAD CAM operator than a guy, a tool and die maker. And so what we're doing is we're saying, you know, we just need to get really good at the blue work. Cause at the end of the day, there's only going to be blue work, the creativity work, the collaboration work. How do we collaborate? How do we combine ideas? How do we lower the, you know, how do we say, you know, a plus B, we you know one plus one is three. Uh, and um, your listeners I'm sure are, are familiar with some of the, you know, great collaborations throughout history. Uh, interesting thing in the economist the other day uh, more and more songs are these you know collaborations santana and madonna or something like that and um, it's a trend so how do we collaborate how do we use the ideas of others to increase en enhance our ideas and how do we present ourselves and ask questions of others to enhance their thinking and their ideas that's where the where that's where you want to be for the future and um <clears throat> So if there was one question that you wish people asked you, what would it be? I don't know. When are you going to come visit? <laughs> I like to hear stories. Uh, we, we put it on our website. There's a standard sort of contact us. But uh, one of the best things we ever did was there's a, you can click a box and it just says, tell my story. And so we get these wonderful stories of uh, people doing things at home with their kids, at work. Uh, on their sports teams where they've tried something, they've given up control and they've had, uh, they've had great, great, wonderful outcomes. So we get to share that with our, you know, That's with the company awesome. here. That's awesome. So I have, I have um, uh, two more questions for you before we start to, uh, and then an opportunity before we start to wind this up together. And I, I wonder that the, the answer to this question may seem obvious to some, but I'm curious whether it is obvious. And uh, the podcast called the, the business revolutionary podcast and um, I wonder what the most revolutionary thing uh, you have ever done is. Well, I would have to say it's the story of giving, of, of not making, not giving orders. So the deal in the submarine was I said, okay, the, here's the deal. We're going to handshake on this. I am never going to give an order as the captain of the submarine. And it was revolutionary in the sense of, um, Like who, who, who heard of that? Like who heard of a submarine? Cap? We're starting a game company. We're doing a VR game now. Uh, we're building a VR game, which is kind of cool, but I'm not sure that's very revolutionary. It's, you know, VR is, is a thing. We didn't invent it, but we're making a game, a leadership game, a serious leadership game out of it. Uh, the teams can play and they can experience the different kinds of leadership. But, but for me, it kind of goes back to this interaction thing. And I think leadership is about oftentimes, like we say, oh, go with your gut. Yeah, sometimes go with your gut, but sometimes you got to act counter to your gut because your gut's going to always want to play it safe. Your gut's going to want to do the same thing. Your gut's going to, like the best, your, you, your brain doesn't like uncertainty. And so the best way to not be uncertain about what's going to happen is for you to make the decision. So your brain's always going to be comfortable when you say, oh yeah, go out, do this, do this, do this. Your brain's going to give you um, lots of uh, dopamine release and say, oh, yeah, that's the right way to be. And so as a leader, we have, to, we have to act counter to that. So leaders are not only not born, they're anti-born. You're born with instincts that will make you be an achiever, but not someone who can multiply the achievement of others. That to me felt very unnatural. It was something I'm still every day practicing. Mm. 
it sounds like a, a ongoing piece of work for all of us actually yeah i'm a, i'm an ongoing piece of work my wife tells me that every day <laughs> mine too um <laughs> So the, the, the last question I have for you is uh, if your child or loved one asked you for uh, the most important lesson, what would it be that you would tell them? Yeah, I would say uh, I had an experience early on where, uh, well, I was at the Naval Academy. I had a chance to be a Rhodes Scholar, to apply to be a Rhodes Scholar. And um, like, how hard is it to apply? Why not? But for some reason, I talked myself out of it or I, I, I allowed someone to talk, my, talk me out of it. I, I, I'm going to blame someone else on this. I don't remember who it was. I was a varsity athlete. I had really good grades and kind of all the wickets of what you'd want to do. And um, so I didn't apply. And it turned out that another guy in my class who did the same sport as me, but was like a JV and was in the same major that I was in, but had lower grades than me. He might've had some secret sauce I didn't know about, but like just on paper, it's like this guy got it and I could have gotten it, but I, you don't get any, you don't win any contest that you don't enter. I never entered it. So I didn't get anything. And, uh, that happened a long time ago, but it really, uh, it really troubles me that I, that, that, that happened to me and that, I don't want that to happen uh, to others. So you've got to be in it to win it, I guess. Yeah, if you're not in it, you're not going to do anything. <laughs> As yeah. The last thing is I just wanted to hand the mic uh, over to you and ask, uh, what, what message would you like to hand over to the people who are listening to this who are out there and they're trying to do better? Um, they're obviously listening to this, so they're, they're, they're in that realm. What message would you like? Well, obviously, they're the smartest people on the planet. So that's, you know, congratulations to you for that. Thank you. <laughs> but, but here's, uh, I think one of the most important things you can have is this, uh, we call it experimental mindset. So in other words, you don't run an initiative, run an experiment. Don't say, oh, we've made a decision. We're now going to uh advertise in a different way say we're going to run an experiment and we're going to try advertise in a different way and i and i love the word experiment because it puts the onus it puts the focus on the learning it also makes it feel temporary and it's like yeah i'll try that for a month two months see what happens and it just feels light versus uh the heaviness of an initiative change or whatever you want to call it and so um, the idea is like, just keep running these experiments and see what happens. Don't tell your, show up to a meeting 10 minutes late, see what happens. Tell your team you're going to be late. Say, start without me, see what happens. Sit in the back and don't say anything. See what happens. Tell them, Hey, I'm not going to tell you what to do this time. It's on to you. See what happens. I mean, just like, don't make it heavy. Just see what happens. And, uh, for me, it's, there's something weird happens in my head where it just feels like, Oh yeah, that's fine. I can do that. You know, it's like, there's this sort of light and sunniness and, you know, birds chirping versus, Oh my gosh, the ponderousness of a new initiative and how scary is that? And I will resist with all my might. So you're on the right track, try things, see what happens, adjust course, try again. You will, you know, won't be perfect, but it'll probably be really, really good. And it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be better than, you know, yesterday so there you have it ladies and gents time well spent with the amazing david marquet the guy who quite possibly gave away the keys to a nuclear submarine this episode as always is brought to you by the tetricky business revolutionary club you can access the club for free no catches no credit cards no commitments just high quality business coaching and information brought to you free of charge every 14 days by tetricky Check out the link in the description below or visit www.revolutionclub.tetrakey.com. I've put notes for accessing David's book, more information about David and where to get hold of him uh, below. So please take the time to go and check those out. Please subscribe to the podcast and please leave us a review. We love to hear your feedback so that we can improve. Hope you have an amazing week further and here's to you becoming a true business revolutionary.